This morning we have heard two very familiar readings, perhaps too familiar. It's a, little, it's a little like the wallpaper that we spent hours and hours choosing and with which we were delighted when it was first hung. Sadly, after a while, we stop seeing that wallpaper. It becomes simply background in which we now seldom delight. And the same is true of familiar passages from the Bible. We think we know the truths that they hold. So we stop listening. We stop asking. We stop searching. This, they become simply background in which we no longer look for the truths, the truths that they may hold, believing that we know those truths already. And this was the challenge that I faced when preparing this talk. Can I read these all too familiar passages afresh? Can I be open and alert to new truths within them, or at least fresh perspectives on truths already revealed? I'll leave you to decide how well I rose to that challenge. I begin with the opening to the story that Jesus told. The story begins with a rich man and a poor man, a poor man named Lazarus. And immediately, we have the acceptable social conventions turned upside down. In our society today, and I imagine in Jesus' society then, is the names of the rich that we know. Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Mike Zuckerberg. We know their names, but we don't know the names of the poor. Yet here in this story, it is the poor man who is honoured by being named. The rich man is nameless, unknown. And the story continues by contrasting the lives of these two men. The nameless rich man has beautiful clothes and dines every day on sumptuous food. Lazarus, the poor man, covered in sores, would welcome even the crumbs from the rich man's table. And clearly, we ought to conclude from Jesus' story that the rich man completely ignored the plight of Lazarus, even though Lazarus lay every day at the gate of the rich man. Every day, the rich man would see poor Lazarus at his gate, turn and walk away. Not even a crumb would he throw to Lazarus. To pick up some words from the passage we heard in Paul's first letter to Timothy, the rich man had fallen into temptation and was trapped by many senseless and harmful desires. It seems that the rich man's love of money had led him into all kinds of evil. As Jesus' story continues, we find that the nameless rich man was indeed plunged into ruin and destruction. In the images favoured at that time of Jesus' telling, he was tormented in Hades, in agony in the flames of hell, and begged not for a crumb of food, but for a drop of cool water to touch his tongue. So what should the rich man have done? The answer is not quite as easy as it may at first appear. The rich man may have thought, if I give this poor man, this poor shell of a man, some of my food, then he'd only be back again tomorrow and probably with a few more of his fellow beggars. And I'll, and I'll end up giving all my food away and they'll still keep coming. Or you may have thought, perhaps I should give this poor shell of a man a few of my coins so he may, so he may buy some food and some clean clothes. But then he'd probably waste that money on cheap wine and come back tomorrow asking for more 
of my coins. Perhaps faced by such thoughts, the rich man chose to do nothing, believing perhaps that there's nothing he could really do. The solution to the inequality that Jesus' story highlights does not lend itself to simple solutions. Such inequality lies deeply rooted in the way we structure our societies and the way our societies structure us. Perhaps the wealth that the rich man had accumulated had darkened his heart, so that holding on to his wealth and even increasing his wealth was to him all and everything. His money was his and his alone. His to do with whatever he chose. To squander his wealth on a worthless beggar was simply out of the question. It may be, to use Paul's words again, that the nameless rich man had become haughty and had set his hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Faced with the doubts about wisdom of doing anything, or faced with the love of money that had captured his heart, what could the rich man do? And Paul tells us plainly, as for those who are rich in the present age, they ought to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share. The rich man may not have been able to eradicate the inequality that lay within his society. He may not have been able to solve all the ills of his world. But he could. He could have chosen to ask God to soften his heart. To be changed by God's love. To know even a small part of God's compassion. To do what he could to make this life even a little bit easier for someone else. Now compared to many others with whom we share this world, others who lie at the gates of our news feed, many of us are rich. And the ills of this world can seem too vast for us, too vast for us to heal. Yet, yet we can as Paul challenges us, we can be rich in good works, generous and ready to share. We can ask God to soften our hearts, to feel God's compassion, to weep with God's tears. And doing so, take up the words of Albert Schweitzer. We can choose to be part of the cure and not the disease. Amen.